Yale. We're going back to Germany, uh, spending uh, five years in residence uh, as a junior research group leader. Um, and then in 2017, he uh, came to the University of uh, Melbourne, where he still is now. Um, and uh, uh, he, I'm very pleased to say that he's got a future fellowship in, in the last round, uh, which is now the month of doing. Thank you very much, Ben, for inviting me here and for the nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to tell you about uh, recent uh, research uh, about uh, monolayer topological superconductivity. And in particular, we'll tell you a bit about uh, quantum design of Majorana fermions. And um, well, we'll explain to you what Majorana fermions are, why one design them, why this is interesting. But before I start, I want to quickly announce uh, an upcoming conference uh, known as the Water Meeting. Uh, so officially, the title is the Colors Matter Materials Meeting, which takes, which takes place for quite a while in Australia. So it's the 30, uh, 43rd time, and I'm uh, honored to uh, organize it in 2019. So, in general, all topics in Colors Matter Physics Materials Research are covered. Um, we will have a particular focus or try to have a particular topic to be here. So if you think or you feel that uh, it might meet your interest, uh, or you're welcome to join the company. Okay. So um, here's a brief outline um, of my talk. Um, I will give you a short but very general introduction about topology and states of matter. I, I don't know how many people are working in this kind of field, how many parts uh, you have you had in the past few months or years. In some places, there's already tens of people are kind of already very annoyed and bored by topological things, uh, but sometimes there are not so many parts. So well, I try to make this interesting, but I mean, I apologize in case I have worked this uh, intensively in the past. Um, yeah. Then come to a particular uh, subtopic of these uh, topological states of matter, so-called topology with superconductors, and uh, why we're interested in them, how to get them, where to find them, and eventually we'll talk about the common design of my run of terms. Okay, so um, by the way, please feel free to interrupt me at any time if something's not clear or you want to ask something else. So um, now uh, let me start. Um, this is uh, showing you a face of three famous uh, solid state physicists. Uh, does anyone know who that is? Good, this is Dirac. Or let me lose Dirac. This is Majorana, that's correct. And this is Hermann Weyl. In the middle, more mathematician. And of course, there, uh, if you look at Wikipedia, they might not show up as solid state physicists, but rather as, I don't know, uh, famous physicists in general famous for foundations of quantum mechanics and uh, particular high energy physics, of course. But let me kind of show you they actually kind of, or their work, kind of drastically influenced the common matter physics of the last 10 or 12 years. So in some sense, actually are responsible for their, um, their work is responsible for a, a real revolution in common matter research. So in some sense, they became common matter physicists after they died. Okay, um, let's start with, uh, um, Paul Dirac, um, which all of you know very well. And um, uh, in case um, you have um, attended the quantum mechanics class or advanced quantum mechanics class, then you certainly have uh, seen the Dirac equation, which is also the heart of the standard model of uh, particle physics, and uh, which, uh, amongst other things, um, kind of, kind of, essentially explain the electron um, as a spin one half particle relativistic spin half particle, which was uh, um, Dirac's main motivation. At the same time, it also kind of then led to the kind of discovery of the proposal, the prediction, the positron uh, particle with opposite charge, uh, similar to the electron, which was then discovered shortly after. Um, so it's a four component differential equation, can be written in this form, and uh, psi is the quantum mechanical wave function, and this P is the momentum operator, while alpha and beta are just matrices. Alpha, in fact, is a vector of three matrices, which can be simply written or nicely written in terms of Pauli matrices. So it's also important to understand this, but I'm sure you have seen this before, and you all know what Pauli matrices are. You're left with a four by four differential equation you can solve. And uh, well, and we all know how important Dirac is. Uh, so the world today would 
unimaginable without him. Uh, but it's quite interesting at some point he said that, uh, that it's a peculiarity of myself that I like to play about the equation just looking for critical mathematical relations, which maybe don't have any physical meaning at all, but sometimes they do. I don't, I don't know what he had in mind when he said it, but certainly what he didn't see coming is he, this here, um, a topological Dirac insulator, and what is kind of hidden behind this kind of lengthy title is actually a discovery of the first topological insulator uh, 10 years ago. Um, so these systems are indeed Dirac insulators. So um, let me briefly explain what it means. Um, in a crystal, of course, a crystal consists of electrons and ions, and, uh, but kind of, in kind of standard theory, you cannot kind of describe them, kind of derive a band structure, and um, have, so to speak, the excitation spectrum. And these uh, excitations, we call quasi particles. Of course, they're not real, they're just like uh, virtual in some sense, but we treat them as particles, just as we treat, say, um, phonons, the quantized uh, sound waves in the, in the solid, or uh, the quantized spin waves in the magnet, right? So these are our quasi particles, which behave as if they were two particles. In that sense, so these kind of uh, are really uh, Dirac fermions you have here, and now the topological insulator is nothing than a Dirac fermion which uh, is gapped. Okay, so here you see essentially um, the Dirac theory, which gives rise to these uh, so called Dirac cones, and then if you enter a topological regime, the band opens into an insulating state, and it's truly the low energy theory of a Dirac insulator. This has been observed experimentally, and what's really going, ah, I don't have it here, sorry. So, what the reason why the gap opening is actually due to uh, spin orbit coupling. So, spin orbit coupling is not term L or S in quantum mechanics introduced as a small, irrelevant perturbation. Uh, turns out here to be actually the major player giving rise to complete theory of physics. And this is actually what you kind of see at the surface of such a system. While the system itself is the gap insulator, at the surface, this kind of gapless Dirac code appears. Okay, so this is what essentially Dirac means in the context of topological states of matter. Today, topological insulator is one of the biggest and um, 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 fast developing fields um, where both chemists and physicists, both experimentalists and theorists, involved in several topics such as spectroscopy, transport, and electronic structure are kind of uh, involved, heavily involved. Okay, so this is um, uh, what the rock in a nutshell. And uh, so now what about Kaman Weil? Well, um, he was actually the person who directly saw, by looking at this equation, that um, this kind of elementary particle, the electron, described by this uh, wave function psi, um, uh, gives rise to another particle just by bending the mass of the electron to zero. So he said that if the mass of the, such a particle is zero, there should be a new elementary particle, which uh, today is referred as the wild fermion. And uh, you can actually see this because uh, these kind of alpha matrix have this block diagonal form and only the beta matrix is off diagonal, meaning if this is zero, this goes away, and then you have actually two decoupled two by two differential equations, what we call right and left handed wild in these things. You might have heard, heard this before. And uh, so the idea was that there could be a new elementary particle um, if you kind of send the mass to zero. Now, Alan Weiss himself kind of then figured out shortly after, um, they published this, that it can't be because you had to break either parity symmetry or time inversion symmetry, which is not possible in, um, the high, in this uh, particle physics and high energy physics. So he kind of refused the idea. And, um, well, uh, now this is uh, just the kind of the Weiss equation, if you want, and the solution is then what we call the Weiss fermion. Now, the interesting thing is that um, um, it has taken them a really, really long time. Um, so to speak, it has been a while um, um, until indeed wild fermions have been realized. And again, it happened in a kind of band structure of a crystal, um, so, so to speak, for quasi particles. And um, um, well, they have been seen in experiments. Um, there's no, so this is kind of uh, common sense today. So they're well established system. There are many materials showing this kind of low energy physics being described by. Uh, wild fermion. So again, you have a band structure, and at the Fermi level, you might have a low energy theory, a band structure, which looks like uh, a wild theory, or can be described by a wild Hamiltonian. Um, it's now a gapless system, right, because the mass has gone to zero, so mass means equal gap. If there's no mass, there's no gap in the system, so it's a kind of a metallic state, if you wish. Um, but it turns out that actually kind of the system is more interesting because if you remember the original Dirac fermion consisted of what is, was this four component system and now we kind of split it into two different parts, right and left handed. 
in, in order to do this, you had to create parity key symmetry, meaning inversion symmetry, and in the crystal that you have, have can be done, of course. The crystal does need to be inversion symmetric, right? And uh, in particular, you see that these two wireframes are still connected by some invisible string, and this invisible string becomes visible at the surface. Okay, this is something why I also didn't uh, have in mind because if this thing of high energy physics, uh, where kind of the energy spectrum goes to infinity, but here in the crystal, where kind of you're kind of um, kind of um, um, kind of the energy is kind of uh, within the bandwidth, essentially you kind of find energy now at the surface. This invisible string connecting these two uh, white fermions is visible. We call this the Fermi arc arc because it's just it's a Fermi surface which starts somewhere in the middle of the field zone and ends somewhere. Right? It's not uh, connected. It's not a uh, kind of Close Fermi surface, and people can see all of this as well in photo emission spectroscopy. So, again, similar to topological insulators, you start with this kind of uh, metallic band structure, but now in contrast to topological insulator, which fully gaps out here at certain high, energy, high symmetry points, we kind of have these kind of nodes, and these are exactly wild fermions, right and left handed, if you wish, and then kind of on the surface, you should see these Fermi arcs. And here you see kind of uh, simulation, and uh, this is a typical uh, RPS angle, angle result photo emission spectroscopy plot, and you see these uh, Fermi arcs at the surface. And here actually it's the best studied example, uh, simulation versus experiment, color persistence. So this is very convincing, and uh, it, it describes the physics of white fermions. Okay, so far so good. I now we've covered already a wide range of uh, uh, topological states of matter. People are excited about it in these days. And now finally, uh, let's talk about the third gentleman, um, Victoria Maivana. He's certainly the most uh, uh, special or mysterious person, simply because, first of all, he didn't like to publish physics. So, uh, so he, um, he had to be convinced to publish his uh, major contribution, which essentially is the following. He kind of figured out that um, the choice of these matrices in this Dirac equation is not unique. You can choose different types, sets of matrices or different representations. He figured out that by choosing another one, which you can see actually here, um, as a way to make this differential equation real. So you might see that now the alpha equation contain only real matrices, the first and third Pauli matrix and the unit matrix, and beta is now completely imaginary. Meaning that this is real, but the momentum operator can be written as I times nabla. So there's an I, here's an I, and beta also contains only I's. Meaning you can just divide I out of the equation, and you have a purely real equation. Now, whenever you have a real differential equation, then there must be at least one real solution. And this real wave function, this solution, that's exactly the Majorana fermion, so to speak, a new possible elementary particle predicted by the Majorana in that sense. And ever since then, high energy physicists tried to find one. The hottest candidate was for a long time neutrinos. Uh, it's not confirmed, it's not clear if they exist in high energy physics. Um, <coughs> So um, and again, the solution, the Majorana fermion must be a real wave function. And um, now this has drastic consequences. Uh, like the electron, which stays at charge Q, and then the antiparticle is positive onto the charge minus Q, here, um, also the particle, antiparticle must have the same uh, charge. But since the wave function is real, the particle is identical to the antiparticle, which directly implies that it must have charge zero. Um, so this is kind of very uh, bizarre and immediately implies that it would, for instance, be coupled from the electromagnetic field and so on. So there are several uh, consequences following from this. So you're looking really for a particle which is on under particle, and um, that's what people call the Majorana particle, Majorana fermion. Now, um, um, and now, now I spoiled the joke, damn it. Uh, I should have said before, I forgot it, I'm sorry, that. Um, Kind of said that the Majorana was kind of uh, kind of a kind of a, it's a bizarre, mysterious story. And it's not just because he didn't like to publish the stuff. He also kind of disappeared at the age of 39 or so. So he entered the ferry in Sicily and never came back. And uh, so in that sense, uh, nobody knows what happened to him. And uh, so it was kind of shows my good humor. And he kind of uh, kind of kind of um, 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 kind of wrote this uh, kind of perspective article to kind of prepare the community that soon the discovery of the Majorana fermion um, uh, is ahead of us, uh, so the Majorana returns. And as a matter of fact, again, in a uh, colored matter system as a quasi particle, the Majorana fermion has been, I would say, unambiguously detected very recently. And this is um, what I'm going to talk about in the following. That's why I kind of stop here. Uh, let me just kind of summarize this that. Uh, Kind of all these three gentlemen, Iraq, Weil, and um, Majorana, 
um, uh, indeed drastically influence quantum better research uh, with their high energy research, so to speak. And essentially step to the physical revolution in quantum matter physics. Now all of these three topics would be very interesting for a colloquial talk. Uh, I, I'm going to speak about my run of fermions. And um, again, um, I want to emphasize the importance of my run of fermions, uh, which is not only limited to uh, quantum matter physics, in fact, but also to um, um, cosmology and astrophysics for the following reason. So um, in um, astrophysics or cosmology, something called metagenesis, which essentially this is the theory um, where um, neutrinos are considered to be uh, my run fermions. And if that's the case, it might explain in this theory, it might explain the asymmetry between matter and antimatter. So this would be a candidate for dark matter. And that's why people are care about uh, the high energy context or astrophysics context. Now in condensed matter physics, where we have indeed kind of found such a Majorana particle, something completely else, um, the reason for the excitement in the field, and I will point out later that there is true excitement. Um, um, and this is because um, these kind of Majorana particles, when you have them, they are kind of believed uh, to be useful um, as a kind of case that they can be combined with the topology of qubit, which might lead to um, the called topology of quantum computing or photo and quantum. And maybe I say it right now in case I forget it later. So what I say people are not excited about is just about money. So companies such as Microsoft and Google invested recently billions of US dollars. Uh, Microsoft Station Q, for instance, in Seattle, they invested a billion of US dollars just to kind of hire the best physicists all over the world to build uh, the next year's topology of quantum computing. So not that they have already kind of topology of qubit or so, but you see that this is getting serious. It's kind of beyond some um, academic research. Uh, it's really kind of uh, the direction to be to enter your smartphones in the next 20, 30 years. At least that's what the company is hoping for. OK, so um, having said this, let's, let's uh, kind of try to understand what these Majorana particles are and where to find them. And um, um, the principle we're looking just for particle, which is what we call antiparticle. And um, of course, in solids, uh, there is, first of all, there, there, this wouldn't make much sense because solids are still made out of ions and electrons, which of course not there on antiparticles, right? And um, um, so it turns out, however, the superconductor um, um, is a natural place to show my other particles. And, and the reason essentially uh, is uh, something uh, knowledge we have or insights we have from the BCS theory, the Buddy Cooper Schrieffer theory, which essentially tells us that the elementary excitations, so called Ugolibo quasi particles, of a superconductor. So the excitations above the superconducting condensate are um, of that type. You can write them, don't, don't worry about these equations, uh, just for the point I want to make is that this is a creation operator of an electron which spin up, while this is an annihilation operator of spin down, which means it's a particle which creates a hole. So this is actually a superposition of an electron and a hole. Okay? And this is what the elementary excitation of the superconductor is. It's a kind of weird thing, I know. Superconductors are fascinating and weird, and they always, always will be. Doesn't change if you get older. And uh, nonetheless, so this is kind of a result of the BCS theory. Now, if you take the antiparticle D dagger, you see that essentially you get now um, almost what you want, because these U's and V's are just numbers, three factors we can fix, they're not important. But the problem is that actually now the uh, upspin here becomes a downspin and vice versa. So, so to speak, the spin of the electron prevents us from having particles which are their own antiparticles. In, that means we can use this result to say if we look for a spinless superconductor, meaning a superconductor we can't kind of somehow suppress with equal degree of freedom that we spin polarize the system or so, we could actually find a particle which is an antiparticle. And it turns out that um, um, that's the key to kind of really go for my other particle, the superconductor. And moreover, it turns out not only have we to suppress the spin degree of freedom in some way, we also want to have these particles at zero energy. Because then they really uh, truly was uh, like a super position 50%, 50%, 50% electrons and holes. Okay. And um, it turns out that uh, these superconductors exist in nature, at least in principle. They might be called P wave or triplet superconductors or F wave superconductors or so. And if you might find them, they would uh, support the ex exotic excitations of particles which are their own antiparticles. And uh, they would not only they would kind of show up at the boundaries of such such systems or at possible defects in the system, such as vortex cores. Okay, 
if you know a bit about superconductivity, I don't know, uh, anyone familiar with superconductors? Then you are, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in case there's students, uh, so a superconductor, uh, the system which has a vanishing resistivity, right? And uh, the magnetic field, um, it repels actually magnetic field, however, at a certain critical magnetic field strength, the magnetic field becomes too strong. Most superconductors form so called vortex lattices, right? So it kind of small holes. Where you have vortices where the magnetic field types can go through, and then it remains stable for a while until it breaks down. In this phase, you naturally have vortices, and uh, these kind of uh, these kind of excitations would be bound to the vortices. Okay. Yeah. Um, for a little bit of a technique question, but um, I was just wondering if between the normalization of the epsilon u and v and the boson by no bit of space, they can't be equal, but they can connect to fermions, or is that another interesting thing? Um, well, in principle, yeah. I, I this is just kind of hand waving in quotation marks, right? Because they're kind of numbers, I could find a way to kind of manipulate them. Uh, so is, it, is that true for T waves? Yeah, it's zero energy. Sure. Yeah. That's exactly the Majorana zero mode. And, um, no, 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 but I'm talking about the normalization of U and V. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Why chance zero when you do this type of equation? Look, and the thing is the following. But if you do this carefully, this is not carefully, right? But if you write this down much deeper, you would see that creating an um, electrolytic energy plus E um, and spin up would be the same as creating a whole with energy minus E and spin down. Now, if you spin is gone, you have a particle which you create with A E and I it minus E. Now, if you set E to zero, you have exactly creation equal annihilation operator. That's exactly what it is. Okay? Um, good. Now, um, one comment, I said before my own experiments are real, what I didn't say, but assume everyone knows, is that these, 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 these ordinary garments we always deal with, so called Dirac garments, they are complex, right? So in that sense, you could think of a Dirac garment as consisting of two Majorana fermions, real and imaginary part. Of course, they're bound together, and you would never see them individually, almost. Uh, um, um, usually it would not happen, right? They actually work very hard to do it. But in principle, just as a theorist, you can always rewrite Dirac garments to Majorana garments. It's just a kind of rewriting, but you could do it, right? This is nothing uh, special. The question is now, how can you split the Rock fermion into two Majorana fermions? In, it also implies that if you have two Majoranas and you kind of combine them, they might annihilate to a kind of form of the Rock fermion. So the, the really the tricky thing about this Majorana thing is how to kind of isolate Majorana from the other such that it doesn't annihilate. Okay? That will be kind of one of the challenges. Now let me tell you why uh, these Majorana particles are so interesting. Because first of all, you might think, oh, it's my fermion, so it's a fermion. It should obey uh, fermionic anti fabrication relations, and um, this turns out not to be true. Uh, in fact, it turns out that they're so called anions. Like in three dimensions, you know there's only a fabrication proof, so they only contain experiments and bosons. If you exchange two particles, like what we have learned in statistical physics, in two dimensions, however, the group describing this is a so called break group, and there are more uh, possibilities. And one of them, are exactly anions, particles which are neither bosons nor fermions, and uh, particular they can be so-called non-abelian anions. And um, the idea now simply is, it's suggested by this artistic picture, if you have some of these particles, um, you can kind of wind them around, and uh, in that sense store information, right? If you do it with say fermions, you can have only plus or minus, there's no way of storing information. But if you do it with kind of these kind of particles, you can really complicate and wind them around and store information. Particularly, you can store it non-locally, which gives rise to very long key coherence times. So the question is now, why are these fermions not fermions but something else? It turns essentially out that the superconductor is responsible. The superconductor somehow gives something to these particles, uh, which makes them very special, very exotic. And um, um, I'm not going into too much detail, um, just, I don't go, as I said, in much detail, I just want to kind of motivate another thing, which might help you to understand why there's something interesting going on. Let's assume these are vortex cores in the superconductor or superfluid, and the Majorana is bound to them, I call them gamma 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? So now the thing is, um, um, I think I mentioned this would be the real part of a fermion, and this is the, um, the, the, the imaginary part, and so on, right? Now we have this, this, this four Majorana wave function, the many body wave function, and now we just start to kind of, uh, kind of interchange them. So then those two, then those two, and then those two. And if you do this carefully, uh, then you will see that the resulting state at the end uh, depends on the order of uh, pairwise exchanges. Okay? So it means the wave function kind of is different if you kind of first exchange one, two, two, three, or say one first, one, four, and then one, two, and so on. And that's exactly what I said before, you can kind of kind of store information 
in this wave function since they are kind of different positions which the world's not locked in. Well, and uh, this essentially gives rise to what's called monopolian statistics. Um, and uh, this is exactly why these uh, kind of objects are believed to be useful for uh, topology quantum computing. To be more precise, in general, these anions have been shown mathematically to kind of, uh, kind of uh, fulfill or to, to realize all quantum gate operations. So on a mathematical level, if you have them, you could build the perfect quantum computer, which means a quantum computer which does mean power correction, which would be four for the run. And I think that's the reason why the big companies investing into this, because they realize that conventional qubits as available, right? There are IBS quantum computers you can calculate on if you want. Just go to the internet, apply for, calculate on this 20 qubit uh, quantum computer from IBM. But this is a kind of a computer. We need lots of qubits to do error correction. Such a quantum computer would be required. And that's kind of the goal. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. So now it's become more practical um, that we want to build now this thing, right? So uh, this is all theory, this is all nice, and theory often they just are a bit crazy. The question is now how to do this in the lab? That's the challenge. And uh, there are a few topological superconductors. The oldest example is the strong and uh, which was discovered already in 94 by Yoko Shimano uh, Tokyo. And um, um, it turns out that even today, more than 20 years later, it's still kind of controversial if kind of these systems really are topological superconductors simply because they're experiments which kind of are in favor of that, others which are not. And these experiments are all, all very well confirmed. So it's a kind of strange situation. And they're kind of other traditional systems such as these uranium platinum three or propylene helium three, which might be uh, uh, useful for good candidates. And more recently, all the doping into topological insulators uh, has been claimed to be uh, to, to be um, uh, results in a topological superconductor. Nonetheless, if you go into the details, these all turn out to be rather uh, complicated systems. Some of them are as complicated as the Kubrick high temperature superconductors, and um, um, it's a rather messy business. Very difficult to understand, very difficult to do experiments. Not to speak about using excitations to build the quantum computer. Okay? So this is the uh, situation today, and um, 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 if you're kind of uh, reading nature and science, you might have noticed that there's current excitement in these kind of iron-based superconductors, because recently researchers have seen or believed to have seen Majorana experiments of what is called of these kind of uh, um, um, type or iron-based superconductors. Now, um, this is really complicated. Um, I don't like complicated, so let's do something very simple. The most simple thing you can do is actually um, 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 a toy model. So, Theory model again, and uh, it has been introduced by Alexei Kitaev with one of his. He has actually two very seminal, influential papers in the last 10 years or so, or 15 years. This is one of them, and it's really simple. It's just the one new system with a chain, with lattice and it is with just a hopping term, which is again energy particles, and hopping to the right or to the left, that's the chemical potential term. And then you have kind of these protecting pairing terms, and since there's no spin degree of freedom, or oh, sorry, this should be all E. So since there's no uh, pairing term, uh, sorry, there's no spin, this must be a P wave. If you don't have spin, you automatically be, uh, uh, result in a P wave state. You just go this down, and what you want to illustrate is that you always must end up with Majorana particles. And I want to show you how this works, because it's so simple. You simply um, rewrite these kind of complex fermions into Majorana fermions, right? So either you combine two Majorana into one um, um, fermion, or you kind of take your 2D rock fermions and write them backwards into Majoranas. So whatever you do, you kind of can just rewrite it. It's just a trick. You could always do it, you wouldn't change anything, it would just complicate life, right? Now, um, what's happening here, however, is that you kind of um, kind of get a kind of totally nine in terms of the operators. And in a special case, when you put the pairing to zero, hopping to zero, only final chemical potential, you get a Hamiltonian, which looks like this. Just two terms, just two operators in the Hamiltonian. And what you see is that kind of these Majoranas are bound to each other on the lattice side. So this light blue object is the original electron, and now kind of the blue objects are, so to speak, the Majoranas, and they're just forming the electron. This is a complete boring state. You just have localized electrons which are doing nothing. This is the most trivial state of matter you couldn't can imagine. So, boring. Um, now, the other case is that you have um, a pairing potential or superconductor water parameter, which has the same size as the object, and no chemical potential. And it totally looks as simple as before. However, now it kind of connects Majoranas on different lattice sites to each other. So in that sense, this seems to be more interesting and more, uh, um, might be more interesting. And um, um, 
particular, what you will see is that this hematocrit does not contain this first Majorana, the very last Majorana, this is a condition. So you have a system, and kind of two of the particles are not used in the hematocrit, which means you reduce them to whatever you want. Right? And I think that if you just combine them again into a complex fermion, which is not part of the hematocrit, which can be either occupied or empty. And this two level system is like a spin, like a non local spin degree free. The two level system, you can do this with whatever you want. And this will be exactly what they use to do your topological operation. A non-local state, which is protected against prote uh, the, the, against uh, um, uh, backscattering decoherence and so, and um, it's not part of the metodology. So it's completely up to you what you do with this. That's kind of the main idea here, to have unpaired Majorana mode. And the simple model just shows you that there's a way to do it. So you start by down, switch just two or three equations, and then you have it. Okay, it's a special property of these PWX superconductors. And of course, in the great nature, I just said you don't have PWX superconductors so easily. And of course, you don't have spin dispersion. So what to do? And it started actually a field of people who try to engineer this with ingredients which are available, like ordinary superconductors, spinful electrons, and so on. And uh, the pioneers of that are uh, Manucin and his co-workers, and Yuval um, Oreck and co-workers, including several other famous people. And um, essentially, they showed a way how to engineer this guitar change. And uh, the first successful experiment resulted in several semiconductor nanowires, uh, which have strong rush personality coupling, and they have a core proximity to an ordinary SVX superconductor. And um, a magnetic field is kind of uh, applied to it. And then, essentially, what is happening in a simple uh, band structure picture, these are just the electrons, right? P square over 2n. Now we have um, a spinoff coupling which essentially split up and down spin electrons into such a uh, dispersion. Now we um, apply a magnetic field, which kind of opens the gap here. And you see now already that kind of we have kind of um, spin, uh, the spin degeneracy is gone, right? So you can kind of plot the spin in color. You see changing if you go through the band structure. So you have now a spin this Fermi surface exactly here, we can use tensions. And now if you apply the superconducting pairing, it gives rise to topological superconductor. So it's always the same idea how to engineer a topological superconductor. It's like a proposal of Fu K. You need to spin the Fermi surface, and then you kind of apply S wave pairing. You always need to choose triplet pairing, P wave pairing, or higher angular momentum pairing. Well, this has been established in a group of Leo Kogenhoven at Delft University in the Netherlands. And um, this is 12, I think. And this is like an artistic representation. We see the nanowire here. The flue on top of it is a superconductor. Then the magnetic field is kind of along the, uh, uh, like along this direction, along the wire. And um, well, then you would kind of measure the Majorana. These are right here, the boundary. And it can be observed with standard transport experiments. So you apply a voltage and measure the current. And you see this here. With the curves of the different magnetic fields, but then it's zero bias. At some point, uh, a zero bias peak emerges, which is attribute to the presence of um, a Majorana zero mode. Well, it has been having debated, of course, because people are aware that this might be a noble price at some point. And, uh, but I think today it's kind of more or less uh, accepted that this probably really shows uh, Majorana particles. It's more complicated than I'm telling you now, right now. There could be other explanations for these kind of peaks. But just kind of they're like now a second generation of experiment and so on and so forth. People are more or less convinced that it might be true. And this is kind of one of the systems Microsoft is going for, taking like a bunch of one nanowires you can just print essentially on a chip, and then you have kind of hundreds of qubits next to each other. If you could control one of them, right? This is kind of the vision they have. Okay, but well, this is, however, um, not what I'm going to talk about in the following, because there's another few different experiments or another idea of experiments. Um, uh, kind of uh, proposed by Alan McDonald and Andrew Bernevik, and um, this involves the so-called Yu-Shiba-Rusinov mechanism, and I should show you how this works. It's, it's really beautiful. We have a superconductor of a dimension like lead or niobium, and on this surface, uh, because of the surface, you break into symmetries, so you have a strong rush of the coupling right at the surface, and now we place magnetic atoms, magnetic atoms like iron or cobalt or so, on the surface. And because of this uh, U Shiba mechanism, is kind of they're not dynamic; they kind of freeze out, right? And they just behave like classical Zeeman fields, like small magnetic fields. Um, in that sense, you see this is very similar to the experiment before, just a very different system. But the ingredients are pretty much the same. And now the major advantages, as I've already shown here, or kind of indicated here, you can do this with the tip of a static tunneling microscope. This is kind of a nice machine where you can essentially, by applying currents, 
can essentially pick up an electron, place it there, and then put it there. In that sense, you can really build on a uh, like atom by atom real chain. Um, that's at least, again, a vision. Um, um, this was first done in a group uh, of Adi Adani in Princeton. And I'm going to be honest, they didn't do it the way I described it. They just throw iron on the surface, and then they had like hundreds of droplets, and the PhD student had to look at all of them, and then some of them looked like a chain, kind of self assembled chain, and that's what they did use to measure. But still, you cannot see it's a reasonably good chain, right? 20 atoms long or 24 atoms long, and then you can again measure um, the from zero bias peak. And if you measure now PHDMs have to measure it, right? You measure locally, and if you're kind of outside, you just see nothing. If you say in the middle of this chain, you see sheet of peaks, but no peak at zero bias, and only at the end of the chain here, where one you see zero bias peak, an ionic quasi particle. So here you see it as well. This is the topography plot of the chain, and then you see the spectral weight here at the end of the chain. So it's kind of nice agreement the theory. And apparently another realization of excited shape, another one-dimensional topological the superconductor with my runner zero mode at the end of the chain. Okay, so now finally, uh, we kind of bring this in the direction of my own research. Um, um, because this is kind of a very hot topic, many people are working this, and many people try to show that this is all wrong. There are other reasons for these zero bias peaks, and for the people that claim that the purity at the right place can make give rise to zero bias peak, which it can, and it's not, not proof of anything, right? And this debate goes on and on. People who just don't want to believe it. And uh, there's another way of doing it, uh, or kind of showing that the whole system works, namely by going to two dimensions. So if you're able to kind of grow such, instead of a chain, grow an island, right, you should get a two dimensional topology of the superconductor, as shown here in green. And now, such a two dimensional system doesn't have localized states at the end, but instead one dispersive chiral node at the edge of the boundary of the side. Shown here in red. Right? And such a chiral node would be slightly penetrated, as shown here, right? But otherwise, if you run localized at the end of or the, at the edge of the island, and in particular, if you kind of take the momentum along this island, as shown here, K edge, right? You would have such a mode crossing the bias gap. It's like a picture of the topology of the superconductor of the wall uh, insulator. You have the conduction and valence band, and then one mode crossing the band gap. And then you could detect this then that would be kind of proof because there's no way of kind of mimicking a chiral mode which crosses or traverses the bias gap of the superconductor. Okay, that's kind of the motivation. Look into two-dimensional systems. And um, yeah, let me further. So um, the, um, this was kind of proposed because it's a simple idea. And um, um, in the toy model, what you will find is a typical phase diagram where you kind of fix all parameters, but only left the chemical potential as a parameter. And you see, I call this C the minus one and two and zero. So C actually is the topological churn number, so the topological invariant, so something like a topological water parameter. And um, 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 I, I, I think I kind of kind of make this a bit shorter, because I would actually usually explain this, but since I should have finished after 15 minutes, I think I, 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 I skip here. Just keep in mind, this is actually kind of the quantity, at least for theorists, to kind of uh, characterize these phases, okay? And now, um, if we, um, what we're really gonna do is the following. We wanna simulate uh, or make prediction for such an experiment, right? By simulating a finite island of uh, covered by magnetic atoms, and then see what you would measure in a true, in a real STM experiment. That's kind of the kind of first step. Here and of course you can cover everything. It would be very similar to the infinite system, which is easy to solve. But then the question is, what is the effect of finite size? And second, what would be the effect if the island is actually really small and surrounded by a much larger substrate? What would you see? Because of course you know in the infinite system everything looks nice, but if you're working on finite sample, as the experimentalists, experimentalists do, essentially everything is kind of more difficult, more challenging. Uh, signal can be kind of very messy, can be weak, can be weak, and so on. So it's very uh, challenging. The question is, what would you see? Now, um, that's the aim here to really predict these kind of experiments. And uh, just to give you an example, what you would see is um, by measuring, uh, first of all, measuring just the sample of the, in the center of the sample, you would just see the superconducting gap, and nothing is going on there. However, if you place the SDM set on top of the eye, of the edge of the island here, you would see where the gap was before, equally spaced in energy. Um, data peaks, right, because they're five system, you have standard data peaks, low bands, and that would correspond to edge states. And actually, 
can just take one of these levels and plot the wave function, and you will see this wave function of these peaks is really localized to the sample edge. This is fully an edge state. Uh, this is the local density of states. That's what we expect from such an um, edge model. Um, now, um, we also measure um, the different tunnel conductance. So this is simply the current, which is uh, here by voltage. You measure this current, right? So we do this in the green function formalism. And uh, what you can find is that as a function of voltage, you see this kind of step like behavior. And what's really happening is you apply voltage, and whenever there's, then you kind of set, you scan through this kind of energy spectrum, whenever there's a delta peak, you have like a step, right? You have a delta here, you have a step, and then the next delta peak is a step, and so on, right? And this is a typical profile. And now we can look at the tunnel conductance, which is simply the derivative or the maximum of the derivative of this curve, right? And it turns out to be that this kind of quantity is actually quantized. It's quite surprisingly for a, um, a superconductor at all to have a uh, constant charging source, so the, ch the superconductor is particle up to observe, so you wouldn't expect it. But what we see is that the tunnel conductance in units of the, um, the, the unit of conductance, we actually find uh, precisely to be recovered at Um So it was a kind of unexpected result, but what is happening is essentially because the tunnel in the edge channels, right? So this kind of experiment essentially counts the number of edge channels which are there. We have a turn number two, there are two edge channels, and then turn number one, or mine for you, one edge channel. And that's what you can see in such a tunneling experiment. It's a rather strong uh, prediction, although it, it requires a very um, a high sensitivity, a good resolution in the experiment. Uh, and the result will be that the tunnel conductance is proportional to the turn number. Um, so um, when we have finite islands like this, it looks very similar, but I can skip this part because I really want to talk, tell you now in the last 10 minutes about uh, the experiments. Um, and um, so allow me to just jump. Um, maybe one point of criticism, I said this before, so this is kind of uh, done not by uh, single atom manipulation, but just by kind of throwing essentially atoms on the surface. And you can actually see that this not, has not a good periodicity, right? So you're looking actually for something which uh, would be perfect for you really for the single atom, because this might be a bunch of um, iron atoms. And so, um, here, we can do better. These are kind of uh, new experiments. These are uh, colleagues of mine from the University of Hamburg, not a Princeton group anymore, and they're kind of experts in single atom manipulation. So what they can do is essentially take the STM, as I showed you in green, and pick up an atom and move it somewhere where they're not happy. So in synth, they have enough time, you can write arbitrary structures on the surface. That is no good because it's too soft, so kind of the STM picks things in, the atom sinking to the left, right? But uranium, for instance, an elemental superconductor has a very nice surface. And uh, then you might find uh, a big change of arbitrary length, as shown here, right? Up to say 50, 40, 50 atoms. What you also see is that they have a very nice periodicity here. You have a magnetized STM that you see perfectly in each atom. And uh, this is really single atom as indicated here. And actually, you might have seen this before. People show this about molecules. Now we see the first time how they kind of real, kind of in real time, a sample, a topological superconductor in 1D, the white balls are the iron atoms which are picked up one by one by the STM fit and placed in a chain. So that's really how it works. It takes a bit longer, as shown here, but uh, it's possible, and in principle, you could write arbitrary structures. So this essentially is then for us the motivation to say, use this to really kind of uh, uh, see if you can build something interesting, something fancy, and uh, just the first idea. Uh, like a Y junction, which is a very simple uh, device if you want to go in the direction of braiding, can be in some sense easily done. So this is a triangle lattice, that's why it has this kind of angle, but it's, in principle, this can all be done, right? Well, now I said before, I want to go to two dimensions, and in principle, you could also write now two dimension islands, but it takes very, very long. That's why the first attempt, of course, would still be using a taxial crow of a surface. So what you see here is now an iron monolayer on a surface of uh, rhenium with one um, oxygen layer in between. And um, so this is a rather large island, it's like 35 by 25 nanometers, it's like a thousand of atoms. If you did this atom by atom, that would take quite a while. As I said, this is not the first step, right? So just show as a proof of principle that you can get a topological superconductor. And um, here you see kind of the surface of the um, um, atomic structure. And um, so I directly jump to the result. The first row, you see the um, scanning tunneling experiment the IGB, so the, the, the conductance, so to speak. And um, you see this is essentially zero or the Fermi energy. And you nicely see that there's a chiral edge mode, which kind of persists. And then at some point, it penetrates further. Then it really strongly penetrates, such as it looks that everything is covered. And then here, we actually hit the bulk band, 
then now kind of the interior of the island has a higher um, um, intensity or a higher spectral weight. This is the same experimental data, but now deconvoluted. It means kind of the SDM tip is kind of uh, subtracted, so to speak. It looks similar, but this is what we can directly compare to a local density of states calculated here in theory. This theory is based on our initial calculations, meaning that uh, we really take into account all the known material parameters, and then that's what we get. And it's not that you kind of fit it to the experiment, it's really kind of a one to one uh, comparison between um, and, um, kind of a first principle calculation and the experimental data. And you see it's a very good agreement, um, also that kind of the kind of cash flows penetrate and we get some duality. It's an extremely good agreement. That's why I believe we can kind of sell this as the first uh, discovery of the uh, truly monolayer topology superconductor. In case it wasn't clear what we did here, this kind of flow goes kind of here at the middle, at zero or the Fermi energy, right? And then we kind of go up in energy, we're further here and here. And then this picture would be if you did exactly the five band here, okay? That's what we did. And these are kind of just the local profiles where this picture would be more interesting. Now, as I said, so this is the, um, my opinion, the first uh, experimental discovery of a monolayer topology superconductor because we can really prove that we have just a single iron monolayer here. You can see it here. This is the topographic plot. This is just 0.22 nanometers. Uh, the island, okay, this is exactly what you expect from um, iron atoms. And um, then this is kind of, if you kind of go to the island, you kind of see the edge modes here and then how it penetrates into the body for different energies. And this is the theory simulation, which of course is less noisier because this is still at finer temperature, low but finer temperature. And, uh, but I think the comparison is really good. Okay, so now we have a topology of superconductors in 2D. We can have the atom atom things atom by atom manipulation. And the question is, how can we now kind of use this to come closer to possibly building a quantum computer or a qubit, right? And um, I just show you now three examples briefly where we're just playing around. It's really like kids on a playground, just that we are now playing on the surface of a superconductor by placing magnetic atoms there. Um, so we start with an island we had considered before. Now let's just add the chain here, like this and this. And now something very surprising happens in this kind of lollipop uh, geometry actually. We have now here at zero energy, this is this level essentially, right? Uh, it's at zero, and kind of the origin of the fermionic state splits always in two Majoranas. But now it's such that we have one of the Majorana modes is kind of delocalized chiral mode, and the other one is a bound state. If you look at, if you sum up the, the spectral rate, it's exactly 50% here and 50% here, which is difficult to see because it's so kind of distributed over a wide range. But it's really spectral rate 50% on the edge of the island and 50% at the bound state here. So it's very nice to have a hybrid structure between uh, um, different Majorana particles and divorce. And it's particularly interesting because actually uh, um, homotopy theory would uh, not allow this because it's actually phase position between one and two D. But because here we're not in any dimension because it's so finite, you can play around, right? In experimental, you should be able to see. Now this is for a toy model. For the real model, this is the calculation for this island we've seen before. And there's the island attached. And you see the say 50% localized mode here and 50% as a kind of a dispersed mode around the edge. So just waiting for our experimental colleagues to use their fantastic experimental machinery to uh, glue a chain to their island, which they didn't do yet, but yeah. Okay, so um, this is one thing you kind of mentioned that it's kind of uh, where you kind of, kind of uh, that you might go into. Um, another direction is actually not kind of changing the magnetic, the, the, the uh, atomic structure, but the magnetic uh, component of these surface atoms. So far, we always considered that they're just like ferromagnetic. The question is, is this really true? If you know about surface physics, actually, there are kind of lots of uh, reasons why they might something else, in particular forming like um, um, uh, like, like um, spiral or helical orders. And um, I kind of want to briefly motivate why this is interesting. So this is a kind of a picture or a, to a kind of a cartoon of such an um, island, the journal number one, right? We have one pile of Majorana mode. Now, look at the same system, but we kind of invert the spins, like a ferromagnet polarized the other direction. And what turns out, because this kind of works has a symmetry, so now we break in the opposite direction, we get essentially opposite journal number. So you have proved topology in different phases, you know a bit about topology, you know that you can't do the topology phase next to each other without going through topology in the next position. So it means if you bring them together, you're able to create this. So it means there must be a phase position locally here, which means there will be a chiral Majorana mode kind of closing the bulk and kind of the energy gap, right? So that you avoid that they're kind of two insulating phases touching each other. Meaning that such a domain wall would always induce a chiral Majorana mode. 
which is of course much easier than writing an island just kind of forcing the domain wall. And if this is true, just as a theoretic simulation, let's consider such a system. Blue is kind of um, like such a magnetic moment point in the whiteboard, and red means the magnetic moment point out of the whiteboard. And then what you would see is a zero density state, just like this. Nice to see. You really get like uh, kind of like runner modes. So it almost looks like like the back of a chip in your computer also, right? You can imagine at least that this might be really useful to have the Majorana modes where you want to have them. Okay. Now let's go one step further. Um, instead of just having the magnetic domain walls, you could put in magnetic defects. And one um, example of a magnetic defect are so-called skirmions. So if you think of the magnetic background, a skirmion is something like a, a local defect. So this is like when you have like when you kind of invert a spin, then it kind of slowly kind of goes back, right? So was in the extended region, that's what a skirmion. And some systems this is energetically variable, right? You see this as an example here. And of course, this is just a spherical version of what I kind of sketched before. In the center, it points upwards, right? And then at the outside, it points downwards, magnetic moment. So I'll just assume that this happens over an extended region, that it slowly kind of rotates from up to down. And it means that still somewhere between there must be, for topological reasons, a chiral Majorana mode. And uh, in fact, um, we can show this in a second. Before I want to quickly motivate that actually our excellent colleagues, the very same who kind of doing this kind of island, uh, the ability to write and unique um, magnetic skirmons and thin magnetic fills. Again, if they're saying that manipulation, they're able to kind of really kind of uh, delete these skirmons you see here in red and blue, and then kind of write them back if they want to. In that sense, if you were able to put it in a topology in superconductor, you could really write my runner modes, they would have them in kind of in kind of real time, right? Write it here, there, here, there, or delete it. It would be really like a uh, very useful for kind of uh, application perspective. And in fact, if you start in a kind of ceramic polarized system, which is kind of metallic, you see that you can kind of just by infusing the skirmion, essentially uh, infuse a topological phase and the chiral uh, Majorana modes. So in that sense, uh, if you have the right parameter regime, you can really kind of infuse uh, with this STM tip um, in a ceramic background these chiral Majorana modes, which raises the question, can we move them? And in fact, skirmions can be moved easily uh, with an SDF, you can do it, but the big is of optical tweezers, you might have heard about those recently, and uh, in fact, you can really move several skirmings in optical tweezers through each other and so on. In principle, you could really tell a computer to move the skirmings around in an arbitrary described uh, algorithm or so. This is something which, which is people do just not on topological skirmings yet, uh, because they haven't been done, but in principle, this is all done with, or, or possible with a state of the art experiment. So, in principle, you could do such grading. A disclaimer, this is not yet uh, not a good training, there's not yet a qubit or so to do that, because that you also have two Majoranas in each island, you have to do more to kind of block one of the Majoranas, but at least this goes in the right direction that we have this kind of high technological uh, control over an experimental system, we just need to find the right uh, protocol essentially to do perform this training. In the context of a slightly different system, so called one of those small states, uh, sandwiches, superconductors, uh, where you also get Kyle Majorana mode, people have already claimed that you can do non optimal grading, just like you do it with this uh, um, uh, Majorana bound states and do quantum computation. And this is, by the way, uh, group, right? the guy who invented topological insulators and who is now kind of running experimental group just to build this quantum computer in uh, Shanghai. Um, anyway, so you see there's something going on, and people are really optimistic uh, that uh, this might very soon be the first uh, demonstration of topological qubits and not a good training. So, yeah, in the end, I want to just acknowledge my co workers and my student, um, Greg Moore, who's my main collaborator from Chicago, with his uh, student, the Board of Dresden, was involved, and these are our excellent colleagues around Joan Wiesendanger, who has done, who has been doing this critical experiment. Uh, well, I have a conclusion slide, but let me just thank you for your attention. Okay, does anyone have any questions? Um, in, I think, the second example you gave, you said, like, uh, if you want to get a topological phase transition, this is the pin socket that goes down. Um, we need two different topological phases, whereas in your skirmion, I kind of see that the variations of the spins are really slow. So how do you get a topological phase transition there? Well, the thing is that um, um, you have, well, okay, let's first look at this, right? If this is large enough, you definitely have a churn number of minus one and plus one. What is different is that they're different. The churn is different, the topological phases are different. So here, you clearly must have a topological phase transition. Now this picture, uh, 
would imply that there's kind of a very small region, uh, like a tiny island, which kind of is state number one. And then there's a large region around it, maybe not shown here, which is channel number minus one. And then you don't know what is going on in this region in between. 